Good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Kirk with Pennsylvania FarmLink, and I just want to welcome you to our webinar, Women in Agriculture. Today, we're going to focus on stress on the farm. And uh, I'm going to give you just a brief overview here of PA FarmLink and um, what we do and what we have to offer. Let me see here if I can share my screen. Okay. So PA FarmLink, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We're funded by grants that we get through various organizations. And we also have a partnership with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture where we receive some funding. All of our employees are female farmers. So we understand the challenges that you all face. My two coworkers are both currently farm owners and partners in their farms. Um, I am retired from farming. I, for over 20 years, I ran a cow-calf operation with my late husband. And um, so I understand too what, what you go through with communication and stress and, and everything. Um, one of the big things that FarmLink does is succession planning. We do workshops, we have resources and certified transition coordinators that will work with you and sit down with your family to get a succession plan in place, which is one of the most important tools for your farm is to get that next generation started and to have that plan in place so that you have continuity of your farm. We have an online database that is full of land that's available across Pennsylvania. Uh, there's also a part on there that is for farmers to enter. So if you are looking to farm and are new and beginning, you can list yourself, even if you're not new, a new or beginning farmer, you can list yourself if you're looking for more land to farm or looking to move. Um, you can put on there what you're interested in, what your, your history is, what kind of experience you have. Um, and we keep everything confidential until you reach out to us. If you're a landowner and you're looking for a farmer, you put your farm on there, what it has to offer. And then if someone's interested, we get a resume and we send that to you to review and you reach out to the farmer directly if you're interested in working with them. We have a bunch of new and beginning farmer resources that are on our website. Our resource central is loaded with everything and anything you can, could ask for related to agriculture. And if you don't see it on there, shoot us an email and we'll help you out and try and find it for you. Uh, our land leasing document, Drafting Agricultural Leases, is a workbook that we have available for purchase that will walk you through the leasing aspect of farming. I know many, many people are le just leasing because it's expensive to purchase land. Um, there's also examples and templates in that workbook for you to use. Uh, how this program got started, we recognize the need for a specific program programming for women. Um, there's not a ton out there. It's getting a little bit more widely spread now, but um, we recognize that there was definitely a need and communication is one of the number one stumbling blocks that we see when we do succession planning and anything else when we work with farmers. Um, it's tough being a female farmer and trying to communicate. You all wear many hats. You work on and off the farm. You try to take care of the house, the kids, the book work, and it's it's tough, but we're all the backbone of the farm. And if it weren't for us, I don't think, don't think the farms would keep running quite as smoothly as what they do. Um, so we're just trying to come up with communication skills to help you guys understand that there's different styles and how how to better communicate with the person that you're working with on the farm and off the farm, whether it's a seed salesman, fertilizer, the, the equipment salespeople, you know, just, just to try to, to understand how to, to communicate better and understand how they communicate so that you can not necessarily be confrontational, but be able to get yourself across to them. So the future of this program, uh, we have a packet of resources that will be put together and mailed to everyone who participated in this webinar and the last one that'll be coming to you. I hope to have that out to you all by the end of the month. It's going to be loaded with communication information. Um, we have some quizzes in there that are great for you to take along with your family members or partners that are in the farm with you, whoever you're working with on the farm or whoever you have communication issues with to help understand their style. The links to both webinars will be sent to you all and it will be on the website in the future. In spring of 2022, we are hoping that in-person workshops will be possible and they will again focus on communication and stress. And we're, we're hoping to do them in person because we have some fun stuff that we want to have people in person to show you actual, you know, ways to reduce stress and, and that kind of thing. 
Um, we're going to do some a series of articles that'll be in local ag publications later this year and beginning next year. And then a video series will be the last thing that we do next year and will be on the, the uh, FarmLink website. So keep an eye out for all that stuff. Uh, updates will be on our Facebook page and the website and um, registration and everything for those workshops. We're hoping to have them scattered across the state so that everyone has a chance to get to them. Contact information for us. If you need to get a hold of us for anything, just, just let us know. And our funding for this project was provided through the Northeast Extension Risk Management Program and the USDA, and we're grateful for that. So now I am gonna turn it over to Kate Downs with New York FarmNet, and she's going to discuss stress and some ways that you guys can reduce stress and deal with it a little bit better and, and more health, healthily for everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. How are you? I won't take a I'll take a little bit of time, but uh, you know, this is a really important topic and very near and dear to myself. I'm Kate Downs. I'm the outreach outreach director with New York FarmNet. So I'm joining you from central New York today. And we are a program of Cornell University and supported through funding from New York State Department of Ag and Markets and the Office of Mental Health. So today we're going to talk a little bit about minding yourself and managing stress because you are your most important resource. So we're going to talk about how to take care of you. And if at any point you need to step away because this is too tough, that's okay. Um, just take care of yourself, do what you need to do to be well. So just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about a little bit about COVID because I'd be remiss to do that. Um, identifying stress, how to talk about stress, building resiliency, and some additional resources. So I know this uh, almost 20 months now has been incredibly challenging on everyone, especially farmers and especially farm families and folks with children and really everyone. Um, but the American Farm Bureau Federation did a poll in partnership with Morning Consult to measure the impact of COVID-19 on rural mental health. So I don't need to read all of these to you other than there's been an impact on rural mental health and because of COVID-19. Michelle, I think is gonna, she's got a couple links to share to pop into the chat if you wanna do a deeper dive into this poll because it's really, really fascinating to me and it just measuring the impacts of mental health in our rural communities is really interesting. And, you know, farmers and farm workers say that COVID-19 has impacted their mental health. So, you know, and, it, and that it's really important to reduce the stigma about mental health in agriculture. So I think we all know that now there's information <laughs> to back that up. And um, yeah, Michelle's sharing those right now. Again, just more, more data from that poll. Yeah, 56% of rural adults and 58% of farmers and farm workers have personally experienced more mental health challenges than a year ago. That's, that's a big number. Um, they're 7% more likely than rural adults to say stress or mental health have become more of a problem in their community in the past year. Social isolation is an issue. We know that, you know, on a, a good day that farmers are generally pretty socially isolated. But this one really stuck out to me. The majority of rural adults agree that cost, availability, accessibility, stigma, and embarrassment would be barriers if they were seeking help for a mental health condition. I think we can probably all relate to that. Um, it's really hard to ask for help, <laughs> but when you're facing things like you might not have insurance or you might not know where to go, or there might not be a mental health care provider even within an hour's drive of where you live, not to mention the stigma and embarrassment that kind of fills fills in the background, that, that, that's a big, big barrier to reaching out for help. So what, what is stress? 
right? Well, technically, according to researchers, it's a need or demand people confront that's perceived, perceived as burdensome or threatening and can lead to physical or mental health problems. The World Health Organization puts it very simply, it's feeling troubled or threatened by life. In essence, it's how the brain and body respond to a demand, right? So the most, most common types of stress are the acute stressors. You know, it's thrilling or exciting in small doses. It's planning for a wedding or a baby shower um, or planning for a trip someday when that's normal again. It's, you know, it, this is what prepares your fight or flight. It's the most recognizable. It's life. It's what happens to us every day. It's a fender bender, a deadline, it's harvesting, it's planting, uh, starting a new job. And it's really treatable and very manageable. Chronic stress is the kind of stress that really grinds on people and wears you down. It's long-term, it's not thrilling or exciting. I would, it's the stress of poverty or trauma or oppression or stressed families or chronic illness. And in this instance, many times professional help is needed. And that professional help can look like a primary care physician. It can look like a psychologist, a social worker, a therapist. It, you may initially start with clergy member, a reverend or a pastor, and then go on to someone in the medical field to get more assistance in that. We know that some stress is good. We want that fight or flight to kick in if we're being chased by a bear or if we need to plant the crops or harvest those crops, but that prolonged chronic stress is what we're trying to avoid. I mean, we all have stressors, right? These are just some of the big ones that might be weighing on us, right? The fear of the unknown and what that, that uncertainty is really unnerving. COVID, feeling of loss, a failure, lack of social support, continuing the legacy of farming, might not have health insurance or good health insurance. Commodity prices, the state of the world, having kids in school, not getting paid having to dump milk, farms going out of business, this wild weather we're experiencing and how that impacts crop yields, changing government regulations, changing regulations around COVID, being isolated. All these different things are different stressors. This is just like a small slice of the pie in our regular stressors, right? <clears throat> but many of these, are things we have little to no control over, right? There are certainly things we can do to mitigate debt or figure out how to work with family, or you know, we certainly can work with stigma. Maybe we can work on isolation by reaching out to folks, but weather and crops and the state of the world, we have no control over. So that could be kind of big, that can be big and heavy, right? So signs and symptoms of stress oftentimes present, stress often presents physically with a headache, stomach ache or gastrointestinal issues, back pain, heavier tight chest, really tight muscles, neck or shoulder pain, rashes or a rapid heartbeat. And that's because our body keeps the score of the stress that we're, we're carrying around. And if we don't have anywhere for it to go, it just settles into our body and presents these different ways. Behaviorally, it can look like incre increased substance use, overeating, drinking a lot of coffee, lots of chocolate. Um, it could be verbal or physical abuse. You might be really short tempered with your family or your partner, unable to focus might have trouble communicating and Michelle touched on that um, at the very beginning. It, it, stress does that, it makes our brains kind of like extra weird and extra mushy. Um, you might have trouble sleeping and, or feel tired, really fidgety, you can't sit still. You might just feel sad or guilty and you just might have this, this unending worry, right? Emotionally, it can show up as impatience or frustration could show up as depression, as anxiety or on edge, 
or you might have difficulty controlling emotions. The simplest thing can send you into a puddle of tears. And that's your body's way of saying, hey, red flag, something's going on here. Um, pay attention to me, listen to me, I've got something to say. And when stress builds up, it can lead to getting trapped by those thoughts and feelings. Emily Nagoski, she is, she wrote a book with her sister called Burnout. And in it, she says, emotions are, in, are an involuntary neurological response. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And oftentimes with our feelings and our emotions is that we don't move all the way through them. And when they get trapped that in that middle part, that's when that we feel them in our body. And that's why they're sitting in our bodies, right? So if you think of it like a train, that's why I put a tunnel, right? Um, you can like notice that stressor, like, oh, I see you, okay. We're gonna move through that. We're gonna feel our feelings and like really feel with them, feel them and sit with them. It's uncomfortable and hard to do. And this takes a lot of practice. I'm still working on it myself. So, you know, it's not like, oh, I see it. I got it. Okay, we're good. Um, it takes a lot of practicing and then moving through it. So, okay, I'm feeling really sad right now or worried about my kids being in school. What can I do? Here's what I'm going to do for myself. Here's what I'm going to do to prepare my kids. Okay, we're going to work through this as a family and then working through it. Oh, okay, there's an end. And once you work through it, work moving through it, um, then it doesn't build up in your body like that. So if we just remove all the stressors, then we'll be okay, right? Not really. I wish it were that simple, right? You know, um, removing the stressors certainly helps and is part of the process, but it doesn't mean that stress cycle is complete. Moving is really the key to completing that cycle. So physical activity or movement is needed. And we all move every day. It could be for a walk around the farm. It could be a walk up and down the road with our dog. It could be a walk around our backyard. It doesn't have to be like, go run a marathon because that's probably not realistic for most of us, right? Um, becoming a yoga master is also not a reality many of us can afford. So just making time for physical movement helps work our emotions through our body and out. And it's when they build up that stress becomes a problem. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. So how do we talk about mental health and stress? And I think this part is really important. And I think part of the reason we don't talk about it is because we don't necessarily have the language and language is really, really important. And also with this, Michelle mentioned the communication. We want to make sure we want to be better communicators. So having the language to talk about stress and mental health is is really important. So language really matters in removing that stigma, breaking that down, removing that shame and embarrassment that feels loaded behind that the phrase mental health. So when talking about suicide, there's some very simple things we can do to remove that stigma. So we can say died by suicide, they died, they took their own life, they suicided, they killed themselves. You'll notice here that I take the blame off that person. They're not committing suicide. It wasn't a successful suicide um, because it's never successful when someone dies, right? Um, so just store this away, try to, try to change your language. Um, also, they have a mental health challenge, not they're crazy. Um, they're struggling. You know, they're not psychotic. So just very simple words and ways we can change our language is really important and can make a huge difference. So signs and symptoms of chronic or prolonged stress. You might notice a change in routine, a change in Ill increase in illness, increased accidents, their physical appearance changes kids show, show signs of stress. I'm sure we can all relate to that. Um, you know, when we're real, really stressed out, our kids are little sponges and they soak that up and they reflect it back to us. You might wanna sleep a lot or you might not be able to sleep at all. That brain fog I had mentioned earlier, you're at an increased risk for heart attack or stroke. Chronic stress 
puts you at an increased risk for suicide. Adrenal exhaustion, your body's adrenal glands are literally exhausted and worn out and they have nothing left to give. So you're not really able to work through that fight or flight. You're kind of just in that freeze area. You're not able to handle simple stressors, simple stressors, those acute stressors, as well as you were before. And all of this can build up and lead to mental and physical exhaustion, illness, and collapse. And there's lots of risk factors for suicide. So mental health disorders, mood disorders, like anxiety and depression, those are actually the two most common mental health disorders, not schizophrenia, not psychosis, it's anxiety and depression, and they present in the majority of our population. So a family history of suicide, I'm moving really quickly, so please stop me with any questions. Um, a family history of suicide can increase your risk factor for suicide. If you have a substance use disorder, intoxication, more than one in three people who died by suicide were under the influence of alcohol at their time of death, feeling hopeless, previous suicide attempts, your access to firearms, that's, um, serious chronic illness increases your risk. So your gender, I want, I want to point this out, especially being talking to women in agriculture, women are more likely to attempt suicide, but men are more likely to die by suicide because they choose a more fatal means. So women, we, we see you, we, you know, we see you struggling and know that there's people out there who want you to be well and want to take care of you. A history of trauma or abuse, prolonged stress, a recent tragedy or loss, that could be, you know, someone dying, that could be losing the farm, that could be um, a car accident, you know, any number of things. A recent tragedy could be COVID-19. Um, it's been a huge traumatic event on our, our culture. Job or financial loss, loss of relationship, be it death or divorce, or a kid going off to college or even back to school. That lack of social support or a sense of isolation like many of our farms and rural communities, and exposure to others who may have died by suicide, either in your community, in real life, or over the media on TV or social media. So suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. It's, it's in the top 10, which is pretty incredible. The rate of suicide is highest among middle-aged white men. And um, I said that women are more likely to attempt suicide and firearms accounted for half of all suicide deaths. And so I just want to note that I compared this suicide in the U.S. data to the USDA Ag Census from 2017, just to kind of draw, to connect those dots. So it looks like in Pennsylvania, there's 90,461 producers. Those producers are predominantly male. 23,000 of them are age 55 to 64, and most of them are white. So many of our farmers really fall into this category where they are sort of in that, that hot spot for suicide risk. So just think about the farmers in your communities, male or female, and and, and just know that they may be extra delicate, I guess is the way to say it. Um, they, they're just at a higher risk. And then in Pennsylvania, apologies if this is hard to read, um, but it is the 11th leading cause of death in Pennsylvania. It's the fourth leading cause of death for folks aged 35 to 54. Um, it's the second leading cause of death for folks age 10 to 34. So this is a real problem in your state. It's a real problem everywhere, but it's um, a real problem in Pennsylvania. And over six times as many people died by suicide in 2019 than in alcohol-related motor vehicle accidents. So it's a pretty staggering statistic. So just, and I got this from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention um, 
I believe that link is in the chat if you want some more resources or how to talk to folks about suicide or you want to learn more about suicide prevention. So suicide warning signs, you know, pretty commonly we hear folks talking or writing about suicide death that could be over chat, that could be um, on social media, just talking day to day with folks. They might feel hopeless or like a burden. They might start giving really prized or treasured things away. You may notice they might make a plan or acquire means. So they might be buying guns or might be buying ammo. And I know this time of year it's hunting season. So that's a little, that might not be the best indicator, but um, it could be a sign. They might start saying goodbye to people sort of offhandedly. They may further isolate themselves from the community. You might notice they're losing interest in things they normally cared deeply about. You know, if they were part of the choir at church on, if they were there every Sunday and all of a sudden they're drawing back, that might be something you pick up on and reach out to them. You might notice a mood change. So a lot of times you hear folks say, oh, I had no idea, they seem so good. So what can happen is that if a person is feeling so down and trapped in this low valley of being depressed or hopeless, and then they make that decision, like I am going to attempt suicide, that thought may provide them with some relief that they're, they're, they're not gonna suffer anymore. So they may actually start, their mood will change and will peak back up um, or rise back up and they might seem okay and kind of normal, quote unquote, again. And so if you've noticed someone really low and down and depressed and then all of a sudden they seem happy and not depressed anymore, that could be a sign that they've made that switch to, okay. <laughs> I'm going to attempt this. Um, and at that point, I would really consider reaching out to them. You might notice them acting more recklessly, increased substance use, changes in their sleep patterns and being more anxious and more agitated. So when asking about suicide, this is really challenging. This is really hard and it's not easy. Use I statements. Ask, present the facts about what you've noticed. I've noticed you withdrawing from church. I've noticed you with not going to the diner every morning for coffee. I've noticed that you seem agitated or kind of restless lately. Is everything okay? Ask questions, but don't push. Remember, this is about the person, not you. Their experiences are not the same as yours. Their perspective is not the same as yours. Their culture may be similar, but not the same as yours. And they might use language if they're feeling kind of push too much, that is really uncomfortable for you. But this is their experience, not yours. You're there to see them and hear them and be with them. So asking about suicide, it's best to ask them very directly if they're thinking of suicide. Are you thinking of killing self, yourself? Are you having thoughts of suicide? Asking that person directly does not increase the risk of suicide. It doesn't give them ideas. And in fact, it can provide a relief to that person that someone sees how much they're struggling. And if it's not a definitive no, it could mean yes. So it said just to ask them four times, um, are you thinking of suicide? Are you having thoughts of suicide? Ask them four times, um, unless they're like, oh God, no, no. Um, unless you get that, keep asking. Ask, continue asking questions. Okay, well, how do you have thoughts of how you might kill yourself? Like, what do you have a plan? What does that plan look like? The more details they have, the more likely they are to act on those, on their plan of suicide, of attempting suicide. Um, so, you know, ask those open ended questions without judgment. Be aware of your body language because you don't, your body language can really speak volumes. The tone of your voice and your words are really, really important. And a lot of times we want to get this person from being worried about, you know, attempting suicide to a safe place. 
right? So we're there to listen as long as it's safe for you, as long as you're okay in that situation. So what if they say yes? Take them seriously. Yes, this presentation will be shared. Um, ask if they have a plan, if they have means. Don't leave them alone if it, as long as you're able to stay safe. Um, if this person has experienced this in the past, what's been helpful to, to them? Call for help. <laughs> you know, there is a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. They're, the folks there are incredibly helpful. And in, I think next year, the 988 number kicks in. So you don't have to remember that big, long 800 number. You can always call 911. The crisis text line is also a great resource, 741741, to text with someone if you're not able to directly call or you feel uncomfortable calling and speaking. Um, call for help. Don't be alone with that person. Make sure they get the help they need. Um, I say this, I'd rather have someone really upset with me for calling 911 and them being taken to the hospital and making sure that they're safe than to read their obituary the next day. So it is, this is really uncomfortable and hard, but we can do hard things. And especially when we can save someone's life. So I wanna end on a quick positive note building that resiliency. Resiliency is the ability to bounce back. You know, it's maintaining positive physical and emotional functioning despite challenges. Resilience is not sucking it up, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Just keep going, just keep trucking. It's not a, a binary state. It's like you're either resilient or you're not. It's a spectrum of resiliency and you can build it and add tools to your toolbox and become more and more resilient as you continue. And it's not the same for everyone. So what works for me may not work for you. Building resiliency, confronting reality head on, believing that life has a purpose, at being adaptable and flexible, which as farmers, I think, Y'all are pretty good at that. You have to you have to adapt and flex every single day. Sometimes minute by minute, you're adapting and flexing. Having a good perspective and having healthy habits. So eating good foods, getting enough sleep, um, being physically active, which I know on a farm is like me saying that is pretty silly, but farmers are so active and have so many coping tools around you that you know you can work with the earth, you can work with plants or animals, and they are they they have a lot of really kind of great superpowers, I think. Um, and then some good coping strategies: recognize and acknowledge your feelings. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to have a really crummy day, especially on a Monday um, or whatever day of the week it is. It's not Monday. <laughs> um, it, be kind to yourself. Have that positive self talk. My, my therapist that I work with, she always reminds me, well, you wouldn't talk to your daughter that way, right? You wouldn't talk to a five-year-old that way or your grandma that way. Be kind to yourself. Breathe. Remember to breathe like deep belly breaths. Connect with people. I know right now it's kind of challenging with COVID, but connecting with people as much as you can in a way that feels safe to you. Get outside. Limit your media exposure and your information flow. Remind yourself of those strengths and values that you have, because those are really, really powerful. Talking it out, it feels really good to vent to a friend or to a therapist if you have one. Um, do something you love, find a hobby and get into it. I've been knitting my brains out over COVID. So many knit creations because having that creative movement is really good. Set boundaries. This one's not hard and or is very hard and takes a lot of practice. Saying no and meaning no saying that yes when you really want to, accepting your feelings, like, okay, I'm feeling pretty crummy today. That's okay, it's just today, or it's just this moment, right? I can do things to move through it. Moving your body, obviously, you know, that helps move the feelings and that stress through our bodies and working them out and focusing on the present moment. So think of five things you can see, four things you can smell, or hear, you know, kind of think of your five senses and what can you see and hear and smell and touch to bring you back into the here and now. And if you don't know what to do, that's okay. 
Um, there are people out there who want to help you, who can help you and have the training to help you. So reach out to them. Connect with your local county offices. Um, they'll know of the best resources in your area. And that was a super fast presentation. I hope I didn't speak too quickly. Please let me know if you have any questions or if you don't feel comfortable asking, here's my contact information. I'm best reached by email, um, kdowns, downs with an E, at cornell.edu. And Michelle also has my contact info. And then here's some additional resources for you all. But the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and the Crisis Text Line, I can't speak enough of. There's such great resources that are available to everyone. And that's it. Thanks, Kate. Um, we do have another speaker with us today uh, from PDA, but first we're going to open it up. If you have any questions for Kate, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll get them answered. Um, we'll give you a few seconds here. Um, I know it's a tough subject, what Kate just talked about. Um, it's hard. It's it's not easy to to admit, but like she said, it's it's okay to not be okay. When I lost my husband, I learned that you know it was okay to admit that I was having trouble with it. And there's still to this day, it's been six years, and there's still days that I just you know I can't I can't deal with it. Tomorrow is actually will be our would be our twentieth wedding anniversary. So that's that's going to be a rough day. I already know that, but you know I'm trying to to make sure that I can push forward and get through that. But just have somebody to talk to, have those people that you can open up to. If you don't have a close friend or family member you feel comfortable opening up to, you know, find a professional, find someone in the ag community or someone else who's who understands and has been through what you've been through. Thanks for sharing that, Michelle. I'm so sorry sure. for the loss. Um, Darlene commented in the chat, if, you're dealing with someone who may be suicidal, do what comes to mind, trust your gut. If you think you should remove the ammo from the house, do it. Gun locks, those trigger locks are, I know police agencies in New York have them pretty available. That might be a good tool. Maybe just moving the gun to someone else's house and not even having it around. It's also a really good option too. Um, thank you for yeah. having me. Yeah. I sure. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate important. it. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. And I will be um, including some of all of Kate's contact information will be in those packets that I mentioned earlier and um, some more information that I can steal from her to, to include. We'll, we'll put that in there. That'll be great for everyone to have on hand. And with that, I think then we, well, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Um, if you have if something pops up while Christy's speaking, feel free to continue to put it in the question and answer. Um, oh, here we do have one over here in the chat. How do you get intervention for depression of a spouse? No one wants to intervene. I think there, it would be really good to present your spouse with some of those I statements. I, I'm noticing this. I, I noticed your you know, feel kind of short tempered with me lately, or, you know, you're seem kind of sluggish and you're not sharing words or the communication challenges. Um, but just presenting them with the facts that you see may, may help them open up to you and say, well, why don't we make an appointment to go talk to a doctor or, you know, do they have a good friend? Maybe that friend is noticing how depressed your partner is as well. Maybe the two of you, you don't want to, to like come at them, but getting someone else to notice that they're not themselves, I think is really powerful. And then making sure that you're there with them, showing that you're there to support them, I think is really powerful. Um, and then reaching out to starting with your doctor, your primary care physician, if you have one, I think is a great place to start. That's where I got started in my journey of mental well-being, um, And my doctor was really an incredible resource and helped directed me to all different resources in my area. And I'll, I'll add thing. a little bit to that, Kate. Um, I think the I statements are really good because that person may not realize how bad they seem to everyone. Um, I know after my husband passed away, I 
I knew that I was depressed, but I guess I didn't realize how bad that it appeared to everyone else until my son, and he he's grown. He was in his early 20s at that time. Um, he came to me and he said, Mom, I can't lose you too. And that really made me realize how bad that I that I looked outwardly to everybody else and how bad that they thought how severely depressed they thought I was. I never did have the thoughts of suicide, but it appeared, apparently appeared to others that I did. So maybe just saying that to them, you know, I see that you, you don't seem yourself will open him up and make him realize that something's, you know, seriously wrong. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, so we will move over to Christy. Christy's going to talk a little bit about risk management, which goes hand in hand with, with dealing with stress on the farm. So Christy, I will turn it over to you. Okay. Okay, so I'm Christy Rebin. I'm the risk management specialist for the Pennsylvania Department of Ag. Um, I also come from a farming background um, and risk is definitely one of the major stress factors in any business, but especially in farming. Um, I also have an a ag banking background, so I understand a lot of the financial aspects of um, farming better than uh, most. Um, and I just want you to think about how risk is an important consideration for your farming business. Um, the uncertainties inherent in the weather yields prices, uh, government policies, global markets, biological pathogens, and other factors uh, impact farming and can cause wide swings in farming income. And risk management involves choosing among alternatives that reduce the effects that can result from such uncertainties. And by having appropriate crop insurance and other things uh, and, and that, you know, for your business to help mitigate some of that risk. Um, today, I wanted to share some resources with you and go through it kind of quickly um, to help you figure out the best risk management practice for your particular farm. Everybody's is different. Everybody's business is different. Um, everybody's family is different. But figuring that out and having conversations with either your insurance agent or your accountant or your lawyer um, and trying to put these practices into place uh, for your farming business is the best way to mitigate some of these risks. Um, what I'm going to address today is the USDA's risk management checklist. This is available on the USDA's risk management uh, page. It's a four page document that you go through and you answer yes, answer yes or no to questions and then you know bring it up to your family or other members that, of your farming business as well as perhaps your insurance agent or other professionals to help you um, alleviate some of your stress and put a risk management plan in place for the many different things that can affect your farm. Um, the, the form is pretty generic um, and the last farm bill, uh, Penn State received uh, a grant in order to update the USDA risk management checklist to make it more current to address some more um, things. And there is a, a web address I'm going to have Michelle put in the chat for both the four page document on the USDA RMA site. And then as well as Penn, uh, Penn State put together a really comprehensive user's guide to the checklist so that you can really think more in depth. And I am going to share my screen to kind of go through that a little bit here now. Bear with me as I get in there. So this is kind of what it looks like. Hang on. Let's share that. Okay, so this is the risk management checklist. Um, Penn State updated the contents the, to eight different risk factors being production, marketing, financial, legal, human, general, food safety, and electronic. Um, so the biggest one I think that faces everybody that crop insurance and the various crop insurance policies would benefit you in talking to your insurance agent is production risk. 
Uh, this relates to the possibility that your yield or output levels will be lower than you projected. Uh, major sources would be from adverse weather conditions, drought, freezes, excessive rainfall at harvest or planting. And production risk may result from damage due to insects, pests, and disease, despite control measures employed, and from failure of equipment and machinery, such as an irrigation pump. Um, I'm gonna go through here a little bit. There's tons of questions on here. Have you recently evaluated your risk in the event of loss of your crops? There's different links here you can go to for um, and help with answering these questions. Uh, have you, you know, looked at your animals, the livestock indemnity program? Have you looked for other alternative production methods? And I'm not gonna go through each question. I just want you to see they're here um, and there's, uh, different websites that you can go to for more information. And again, this is on the Penn State website. Uh, this is really great in helping you fill out that USDA form. Um, and again, this is all for your personally, you don't have to submit it anywhere if you don't want to. This is for you just to manage and see that there's resources out there you may not know about. Um, and again, production risk is the biggest Thing I feel is covered by different levels of crop insurance and talking to a educated crop insurance agent on what would be good for your individual situation. Um, there's also in here about if you can use irrigation and you know web soil surveys through the USDA. Um, and again, that may or may not apply to you, but if it's something you've thought about, you may wanna go out there and see the information that's out there for you. Um, also with production, if you're a specialty crop farmer, there are different uh, rules and exemptions and different products available out there that you may wanna look into as well um, on the, RF, um, the RMA website and the USDA website. The next risk is marketing. Um, biggest thing with that is having a marketing plan. I, I always say to everyone, COVID really brought to light having a marketing plan and changed the way a lot of people did business within, you know, the United States and the world and Pennsylvania. We have a lot of farm side stands and, and you know, farmers markets and a lot of people who were cash businesses now had to go to contactless um, pickup as well as accepting debit and credit cards. Uh, so market risk is essential to know um, and always trying to figure out what would happen if you lost your market. Uh, what if your price was less than expected? Um, you, you know, lower sales and prices due to increased numbers of competing growers or changing consumer preferences are common sources of market risk. They can arise um, due to a processing plant relocating, um, a wholesale buyer going out of business, or anything such as changes to pack packaging requirements or, or government policies. So really you wanna be aware of those risks associated with what you're selling and who you're selling to. Think if is your biggest seller or uh, buyer went out of business, you know, what would you do? Um, we look back at COVID as far as, you know, people dumping their milk and those kind of things and, you know, how we address those issues. So again, there's a bunch on here about how to make a marketing plan, how to expand your markets. And there's so many resources out there um, for you to go to. So I would highly recommend you go in there, figuring out a business plan um, and, and figuring out a marketing plan are so essential to keep your business stable and growing. Uh, the next risk is financial risk. Um, and this relates to not having enough cash to meet your obligations. I mean, that's generally what it is. Uh, generating lower than expected profits or losing equity in your farm. Sources of financial risk commonly result from, uh, you know, the marketing risks I described earlier or the production risks I described earlier. In addition, it may be, you know, costs are higher. You know, we have inflation right now. Everything's costing more, higher interest rates. You know, we're not, we have lower rates right now, but if you have a line of credit, you're benefiting from that right now. But if, you know, rates go back up, you're not going to. Um, excessive borrowing, higher cash demands for family needs, lack of adequate cash or credit reserves, and unfavorable changes in exchange rates. Um, these are all things that play into financial risk. And again, having a business plan really helps you with that. Um, having alternative plans, you know, these farmers markets and roadside stands that went quick and got, you know, the ability to get debit cards and, and contactless pickup and delivery are the ones who stayed resilient. 
and we're able to come out of COVID okay um, and have a stronger business plan for the future. Um, you wanna make sure, you know, one of the biggest things is you need to know your costs, your costs of doing business, your break-even costs, um, your budgets. You know, farming is a business um, and I get that a lot. You know, people, oh, I'm just farming, but there's so much risk, you know, with farming, as you know, and you really wanna treat it like a business and know your, you know, costs of goods and, and, and your cost of doing business. Um, do you do a balance sheet? Do you do cash flows? Do you have an income statement? Having a monthly statement is critical. And again, I don't wanna harp on that too much because I wanna kind of hit on some of the other ones a little bit more, but you can go through these questions. And if you ever have questions for me, I'm always available and we can share my contact information at the end. And I'm happy to help with any of these that you have questions about. Um, moving forward, I'm going to go into the legal risk, and I know FarmLink does a lot with this, but legal and institutional risks are related to fulfilling business agreements and contracts. Failure to meet agreements carry high costs. Another major source in Pennsylvania is tort liability, causing injury to another person or property damage due to negligence. Uh, and legal risk is also you know, related to environmental liability and concerns about water quality, erosion, pesticide use. You know, these are all things coming to the forefront now, um, as well as just simple things like having your will or your power of attorney updated. Um, so again, there's great resources out there on these, this website and to get all this information as well as I can point you in directions for that. Um, again, one of the big things that came out of COVID that, that um, people didn't really address before, these cash businesses, um, now you have compliance to stay on top of on, with your debit card and credit card processing. Um, you know, what are your liabilities for your website and direct marketing and keeping people's information secure? That's all part of that, this as well now. Um, and so, you know, this gets really in depth about, you know, fence breaking and all that, you know, what are you covered for? Have this conversation with your insurance agent. You know, if your cows get out and, and someone hits it and there's damage or injury, you know, how are you covered for that? Um, so I wanna make sure that, that you can have those conversations. The next big one is human risks. Uh, this is associated with individuals and their relationships to each other. Um, this includes family members as well as farm employees and customers. Key sources of human resource risk arrive from the three Ds, uh, divorce, death, and disability. Um, the impact of any of these events can be devastating to a farm. Um, human resources risks also include negative impacts arising from lack of people management skills and poor communication. You know, farm workers are hard to come by. We wanna treat them well as you know, a valued person on your farm. Um, so again, and with all these things being said, it boils down to you know, your personal insurance coverage, your medical insurance, disability coverage, uh, risk exposure to employee accidents or dishonesty. Um, you know, are you covered for theft? Um, have you provided employees with safety training? Uh, are they all licensed to do the pesticides they're using? Um, you know, uh, employee handbooks, that might not be for a smaller farm, but as you're getting to be a pr bigger producer, you know, having that sort of thing to protect you is important. Um, Again, you wanna make sure you have your goals written down. Is everyone in your family em employed to the full extent of their education, their training, their experience? You know, we wanna make sure that you're counting for managing stress, exhaustion, burnout. Um, and then there's general risk. Do you have a confident relationship with your risk management advisors? You know, it's not just an insurance agent. They should be a risk management advisor. They should be knowledgeable in farming and the risks that go along with it. Um, do you know the new technologies that are coming out? Um, are you planning for your children's educational needs and are these savings protected? You, of course, there's your retirement. You always have to pay yourself first to make sure that you're taken care of for retirement. Um, does everyone know where the documents are kept? Um, and are you always looking for ways to increase your profitability? One thing here that we can really help you with too at PDA is food safety. Um, are you, you know, do you have all the proper things in place to make sure your food is safe? You know, we hear about recalls all the time due to different 
you know, pathogens and, and things going on. So you want to make sure that you're up to date on food safety and, you know, taking maybe some training classes on that. Do you know the rules? Do you know everything about food handling? And again, here at PDA, we have a lot of great documents and help with that and a whole department that can help you with food safety. Um, the, the other one here is electronic. And again, do you know how to protect your online presence? Do you know if your credit card transactions are secure on your website? And is your website and is your uh, place of business compliant with the ADA Disabilities Act? Does it need to be? Are you big enough that it needs to be? Lastly, I'm gonna leave you with uh, the crop revenue and livestock insurance deadlines. If you are interested in crop insurance, livestock insurance, dairy revenue protection, any of those, there are deadlines you need to follow um, and, and go by. And that's different for each state, each county. Um, and that's something I can help you with here at PDA or your local FSA or your local uh, risk management agency through the USDA can help you with. Um, there's new products and coming out all the time. And so you may have looked at crop or, or revenue or livestock insurance in the past, but it's takes it might be worth looking at again um, in this day and age with the uncertainty. And again, that's kind of my, you know, wanting to push this risk management checklist, because if I tell you just to look at your risk, where do you start? You don't even know where to start. So this checklist really helps you kind of have the, the questions and then drill down under those questions and then gives you the sources to help you figure them out. Um, if you have any questions for me, you can feel free to drop them in the chat. Otherwise, um, you know, I, Michelle has my information and you're more than welcome to call me. I'm here, you know, to help Pennsylvania producers and farmers. And I thank you all for coming today. Thanks, Christy. Um, I know that we have thrown an awful lot of information at everybody. Uh, there's lots of links in the chat. If you missed one of them and need it, just let me know and I can get it to you. I um, plan to put all this information also in the packets that will be coming out to you. Um, I do not see any questions at the moment. So if no one has any more questions, we are just gonna wrap it up here. And I thank you all very much for being with us. As everyone has said so far, anything you need, reach out to one of us um, and we will get that information to you. Links will be coming soon. Packets will be coming soon. And um, again, just thanks for being here. And we hope to see you at our in-person workshops coming up this spring. Thanks. Thank you.